until now, we've been putting some fairly large shapes in our imagination painting. Now we want to look at the idea of adding a little more detail and texture to the painting. As a general rule, you want to put as little detail in your painting as possible, just enough to tell the story. So now we want to get our imagination painting back out. We want to get our brushes and our paints and go back to work on our painting and add a little bit more detail and texture on there. Now in this particular uh, segment, we aren't going to show camera shots of me mixing paint on the palette. Uh, that's going to be kind of an exercise for you. I'll describe to you the paints I'm mixing, but we won't show you just exactly how we're mixing them on the palette. We're going to leave that as an exercise for you so you can start practicing that. So I'll be back in a little bit. We'll go off now and paint on our painting for a while and I'll come back and we'll discuss some of the techniques we've used uh, to add detail and texture to our imagination painting. All right, we want to continue our work now on our imagination painting. And here we're focusing on details and texture. What we have is a half sheet of Arch's 140 pound rough watercolor paper. It's 15 inches high by 22 inches wide. And it's clipped to a piece of gator foam board with four two-inch binder clips. The gator foam board is 17 inches high by 23 inches wide. Now many of you will recognize the uh, image we have here. We started out doing this as a sketch in our perspective video. and We then did a large gray wash in our mixing color, mixing big, and painting big video. And then in our shadows video, shadows and reflected light video, we finished the painting a little bit more and added some shadows to our painting. All right, we've focused the camera in a little closer here on the fence area. And what we want to talk about now is the idea of defining shapes. What we did here to start our fence is just define a fairly general shape here. We used perspective to give a three-dimensional appearance to the fence and then of course the shadow we added in our last video on shadows and reflected light also gave the fence a little bit more of a three-dimensional appearance. But here today, we want to define the fence a little further as a picket fence. Now when we think of a picket fence, we think of a fence made of a series of wooden boards that have points on the top and a little space between each one of the boards. We've put in a little bit of a pencil sketch here. You can probably see where we've indicated some of the points and some of the slats. And we want to use a technique we talked about in our last video called painting around to put some of the points on the boards. And what we're going to do in our imagination painting here is go ahead and we'll pretend that there's a bush inside this fence. We can kind of see the top of that bush uh, sticking out over the top of the fence and the color of that bush is going to give us the opportunity to paint around these points and kind of indicate those a little bit. I'm going to use a number eight round brush. This is Cheap Joe's Tsunami Line. And I want to go down to the palette now and mix up a green color. And for that we're going to use uh, mixed French blue with some new Gamboge yellow. 
All right, I have my brush loaded up with that green color now. We mix down on the palette. And I want to come up here and just kind of paint uh, just kind of a bush shape here. We don't have to really get, this is just like, kind of like when we did the trees in our last video. You're just trying to make kind of a, an organic shape here. Just trying to indicate that there's kind of a bush. Again, we have to, for the time being, we want to paint around our fence area. If you're painting along at home, just uh, you can paint your bushes what, whatever shape you think you would like to do there. Just kind of a just kind of a bush tree shape there. All right. Now. Let's drop some color in our bush, in this tree area here. Drop a little bit of yellow in there. If you're painting along with me at home, you can go ahead and paint, drop in whatever colors you think you'd like. Paint, drop a little red in there. Practice that idea again of dropping in color. Now I'm going to mix up kind of a dark color with some French blue and burnt sienna. Kind of drop some dark areas in our bush while it's still uh, wet. Okay. Now I'm going to go to a smaller brush. This is a number six pointed round brush. This is Cheap Joe's Golden Fleece line of brushes. And I'm just going to get some of these same colors we've mixed up here. A little green, a little bit of that dark color we just put in there. And I'm going to come right in here and we're going to paint around these points. Doesn't have to be perfect. You just want to kind of indicate these uh, points at the top of these pickets. And remember that uh, if you've got, if we've gotten that that uh, bush we put in there, I'm going to go ahead and just paint around where that telephone pole is going to be. But if we've gotten that bush fairly wet there with paint, some of that pigment will will migrate down into these little triangular areas we're painting here. Just trying to indicate that there's a uh, point at the top of that, and then we'll come around and do the same thing here. Now out here on this part of it, maybe we'll get a little bit of a lighter color. Just kind of making a triangle shape there. To indicate that that might be a picket fence. The idea there is that we're trying to uh, just suggest or define uh, what we recognize as, as the pointy tops on a picket fence. You don't have to get many of these shapes we do when we use this technique uh, to come out absolutely perfect. Just the suggestion of it often is enough. Now we want to come down here at the bottom of our fence. We'll go ahead and stay with this same brush get a little bit more of this green color. I'm going to try to indicate that there are some fence posts at the bottom of our fence by just painting around an area. You can kind of see now that there are some little posts there kind of appearing on that fence. Maybe get a little bit more of a dark color, a little bit more of that French ultramarine, uh, burnt sienna dark color we did earlier. Again, I think I'll go ahead, uh, we don't necessarily have to do this, but I'll kind of paint around where that telephone pole is going to be, getting into darker colors now. Just kind of painting around an area where some fence posts might be. Rinse my brush out. 
Now, I'm going to go to a number four pointed round, a slightly smaller brush now. This is Cheap Joe's Golden Fleece line again. The bristles on the Golden Fleece line are more of a synthetic bristle. Uh, I found these brushes work just fine. Now let's go down to the palette and we'll just kind of mix up a little bit of a bluish gray color. You remember for a gray or neutral color, again we can use French ultramarine blue. A little bit of a burnt sienna. Okay, I've got some of that paint in this brush now. And now what we want to do is indicate some of these slats or some of the spaces between the boards here. Again, you don't have to get these perfectly straight. Just want to kind of make an indication there. Kind of make kind of a thin line. Boards will be a little farther apart as they come closer to us because of perspective. We're just trying to suggest a fence here. Yeah, great detail is not necessary in these things. Just trying to suggest to the viewer that that might be a picket fence. And again, we can come back into these areas later and put darker colors in there. Do the same thing on this side now. Just a little bit of a thin line down there. You don't have to keep trying to go over the line if you, if you feel you've gotten one of them a little bit crooked or something like that. Just go ahead and keep painting rather than keep working that line. And I think you'll find that as we move along with our painting here, it really won't matter so much if you've got a few of these crooked. Now as I said, we'll come back in here a little bit later on with some darker shapes inside of that fence area. So I think you can probably see now that even though we didn't do a great deal of detail here, we've just kind of made the suggestion that this fence uh, is a picket fence rather than just the general shape we had before. And, and again, that's, that's what we call defining shapes. And we use painting around to do that. And then the marks we made on the inside. And then we went down here at the bottom and painted around to form uh, the suggestion that there are fence posts at the base of the fence. So now we want to let all this paint in the fence area dry and we'll focus the camera in on the house area and tree area now and uh, continue on with our painting. All right now we've focused in on the house area and on the tree area. I want to do a little bit of work in there now. Now we want to put a second layer of color on our trees and let that start drying. We'll actually go back into these trees at least two more times. But for now we just want to mix up a color similar to the color we put on here before to add a little bit more texture into these trees. And then later on we'll use a technique to help define those shapes and, and, and make it more obvious that these are indeed trees. So the brush I'm going to use to work in the trees here now is this one inch flat. This is Cheap Joe's Tsunami line, so we have the squirrel hair bristles again. And we want to go down to the palette now and mix up a green color. We're going to use a little French blue, maybe add a little bit of Windsor blue and New Gamboge yellow. So we're going to go down and mix up a green now on the palette. Alright, we have our brush loaded up with this green color now. And what we want to do here now, we'll paint right up to this house again. 
And we're just going to kind of paint some shapes in here in these trees. We're not going to try to uh, necessarily paint a particular shape. We just want to paint some random shapes in there. Just kind of letting my brush just kind of flow this paint on here. We don't really want to scrub that. We just want to kind of get a little bit more paint glazed on top. Remember glazing where we're layering paint on top of dry paint. This is wet paint on dry paint. Or glazing. Okay, something like that. We'll just kind of let all that dry now. Now again, this is kind of an out of control thing where uh, we're just going to kind of trust that paint now to dry and give us a little bit of texture in there. We may not always get our shapes exactly right, but that's okay. You have to kind of, uh, you have to kind of trust this uh, watercolor painting and this glazing and not try to overwork an area, not try to do any scrubbing in there. That's pretty good. Just some random shapes now inside the bigger shape we painted before. We're just going to let those dry and we'll work with those uh, later when we come back in there and work on the trees again. So I'll kind of do that a little bit. Remember using the corner of your brush you can make some finer marks here. Just adding a little bit of texture inside these trees. Okay, that's pretty good. Let's let all that dry now and, and we'll come back in there and work on those trees later. Let's do a little bit of work on our house now. Rinse my brush out. Now again, just as a reminder, when you, when you glaze these other colors in there uh, and, and are putting those other washes of paint, you want to watch out for runs that may form towards the bottom of the area you were working in. Uh, so you can catch those with your towel or with a brush. If you see them start to build up and, look, and it starts looking like they're going to break over. So now in our house, again we're going to use glazing. We have quite a dark color here for the shadow, but now we're going to paint a color on top of that dark color to define our window and our door on, the, on this uh, shaded side of the house, the shadowed side. And then we're going to paint our window on the lit side, on the bright side, on the wall that's facing us. Now for this I'm going to use a number six pointed round. Again, this is Cheap Joe's Golden Fleece, so these are synthetic bristles. And we'll go down to the palette now and mix up kind of a dark color with French ultramarine blue and uh, burnt sienna. All right, I have my brush loaded up with that dark color now. And what we want to do on our window is paint the four panes of glass that would be in that window with a dark shape, with a dark color. And we want to try to save the divider uh, pieces that are in there that are between the panes of glass. Uh, you can kind of see that on this window a little bit more clearly than you can see here. So I'm just going to start in on one of these panes here. Just come right down here and make a shape. Remember our perspective. I'm still following those original pencil lines we put in there from our sketch. They do show through on your various layers of glazing. Now I want to skip and leave that little space between there. Same thing here now. I'm leaving that little light divider piece in there to try to indicate that that's a window with four panes in there, four panes of glass. Same thing here at the bottom. That's just kind of a dark color there with that blue and uh, burnt sienna. And now I want to drop some color in that window while that paint's still wet. So I'll get a little bit of yellow and we'll just drop that in in a few places. Just kind of a thing you have to kind of experiment with a little bit. Now I could go to a larger brush here. I'll just stay with this small brush with this number six and we'll uh, go ahead and paint this doorway now. Now we don't need any kind of fancy shapes here. Just the indication 
of a doorway will be enough for, for the viewer to accept that that shape as a door. I didn't necessarily get my line perfectly straight there, but that's okay. Again, that's something that we're kind of trying to pass along here is that it isn't really necessary while you're doing these paintings to uh, concern yourself too much with getting things each shape absolutely perfect. Just go ahead and put your marks in there and uh, go on to your next thing. Um, you'll find out in the long run if you just wait and let those layers dry uh, between, between the shapes you put on, you, you can always come back later and make adjustments to them. So try to be relaxed and just concentrate on the idea of having fun while you paint. So let's work on that window, on the window here on the uh, on the lit side here. And again, this is just kind of a French blue. Little bit of burnt sienna in there, not too much. Just need to make kind of a dark shape. And again, we'll try to paint around the uh, dividers in that window area. Get that paper nice and wet with it in case we want to drop some color in there. See, I'm just preserving that, that little divider strip inside there. Just trying to define this shape as a window. not really necessary to make uh, a great deal of detail in there. Just uh, give, the, give the viewer an opportunity to recognize that shape as a window. Defining shapes here. Now here again, while this is still wet, we can go ahead and drop a little bit of color in there. A little bit of yellow. Remember for dropping in color you want your uh, the intensity of the pigment you're dropping in to be a little bit more than what you were painting in. Painting in to make, to make the paper wet the first time for dropping the color in. Now I'm going to get a little bit of alizarin crimson, some red. Drop it in a couple places. Now that paper is starting to dry a little bit, so that may not migrate quite the way we would like, but that's okay. Just go ahead and put the paint on and uh, go on to your next thing. Now we can, at this point, maybe add a little bit of shadow, just the indication of a shadow, to our window frame. So there'd be a little bit of shadow under here, and maybe a little bit of shadow over on this side of the window frame. So you can see now how we've added a dark shape on a previously uh, dark area, such as the shadow area here, and we can continue on with that glazing, still putting shapes inside of that darker shape to define a window, a door, and here we have a window defined on our lit side of the house. All right, now we want to do some work with texture and detail down on our roadway. If you remember, we defined our light in this painting as coming from above and, to the, and from the right, moving across our painting this way. So if you look down here on the curve on the road, you can see that that's still kind of bright as if sunlight is striking it. We know that would probably be shadowed. So we're going to go down to the palette now and mix kind of a shadow color with a little bit of French ultramarine blue, a little bit of burnt sienna again. It can be fairly light this time, the shadow color. Maybe put just a touch bit, just a little bit of Windsor blue in that. I've got that color loaded on my brush now. Now I'm just going to kind of paint along that curve there. Just kind of shadow that a little bit to indicate that that's probably in shadow right there. Now we want to remember to let that 
let that paint dry. So we'll go and work on some other areas now. Now another thing you can do on texture on a roadway is indicate tire tracks. It just kind of gives the indication again of the roadway moving off into the distance, kind of helps reinforce that idea of perspective and gives that, as I said, gives the roadway a little bit of texture. So for that we want to mix up a darker color and again I can go with the French ultramarine blue. This needs to be quite dark this time. So I've got my brush loaded up with kind of a dark color now and I'm just going to kind of just just drag that brush, just kind of touch it on the roadway here and just kind of indicate that there may be some tire tracks here. Now we may come back in and, and, and play with this a little bit more. Again, this is just kind of a thing you do um, according to your own preferences. You may not like to add, to add this type of texture in your own paintings and you'll eventually develop your own way of doing that. But for now, just, to, in, just to, to give the idea of this, and you'll notice how this particular texture layers over the other colors uh, we put in previously. This is just kind of a random thing. This might be where the cars have been going down this roadway and leaving a little bit of a, of a mark in the roadway, and we're just kind of indicating that a little bit. And, and as you come up closer uh, to the foreground with this, you can make these colors a little bit darker. Uh, make the paint, the pigment, a little bit more intense or a little bit more dark. Just put a few of those in there. Now in a little bit, we'll, we'll uh, introduce you to the idea of a technique called splattering, where you actually throw droplets of paint against the paper and let them splatter and uh, distribute themselves in, a, themselves in a very natural way across the paper. Uh, we'll come back on the roadway maybe here in a little bit and do a little, uh, do a little bit of that uh, technique on there. We'll save that for a little bit later. Now another thing you can do is, especially on the shadowed side of the roadway, is in your shadow areas you can put a little bit of a dark indication right at the base of the curve. It just kind of helps emphasize that shadowed curve area a little bit, just a little bit more. Now there you can see that the roadway has taken on a little bit of a different character now, or a different look, because we've added another layer on top of what we put on before that gives a little bit of an indication of direction, a little bit of a feel of texture. Alright, now we've focused our work area back in on the fence, on our, on our picket fence. And here we want to demonstrate an, a technique that we mentioned earlier called splattering. To add a little bit more texture into the area uh, where the bush or tree, what, whatever you want to call that particular uh, little bit of foliage we put up in there, we'll just call it a bush for now. I'm going to add a little bit more texture in that now with this technique of splattering. So I'm going to use a couple of brushes for this. Here we have our number eight pointed round. Again, that's the Tsunami brush, Chief Joe's Tsunami. And this is our one inch flat Tsunami brush. Only the only thing I'm going to use on this brush is the handle. Now what we're going to do is take this brush the number eight pointed round and we're going to hit it against the handle of this brush to splatter paint into this area right here. Now this can get a little bit out of control on you. You can get dots of paint where you don't want them. You can kind of blot them up with your fingertip a little bit or a towel if you don't like where they go. I tend to just let them kind of go and not really worry about them too much unless I get one way, way out of, uh, out of bounds. Now to do this, you obviously have to have a lot of pigment loaded up in your brush. And I want the pigment this time to be fairly dark. So I'm going to start out again. Go down to the palette here and we'll mix up a color of some French ultramarine blue, some burnt sienna, maybe a little bit of red in there to make kind of a dark color. And this paint has to be a little bit, this pigment has to be a little bit on the... Uh, 
watery side, I guess you might say, or a little bit more liquid. Uh, so it will splatter for you all right, but at the same time you have to get the intensity of that fairly dark. I have quite a bit of pigment loaded up in this brush. I'm just going to take it against this, other, this brush handle and just start doing this. And you can kind of turn it in different ways to get a little bit of texture in there. Now for this particular example, I'm just going to leave that just as it is. You have to kind of trust some of this stuff. And that just adds a little bit of extra dimension or a little bit of texture into that area. Maybe we'll put a little bit more over here. Now you might notice that down here on some of the fence area, I got some drips. And while that paint's still wet, I can just take my fingertip. It's a fairly small amount of, t of paint. And just kind of blot some of those up. And if you get some of these little marks like this on the fence slat, that just adds even more texture to the overall appearance of what you're working on. Now we want to introduce you to one more technique that we'll use later on also in our trees while we're focused in on the fence area. And for that I'm going to use yet another brush. And this is really a fun brush. This brush is called a rigger brush. This is Cheap Joe's Golden Fleece line, and this is a number one rigger. It's quite a small one. And we're going to go, go down now and pick up some of this dark color we just used for splattering and get it in that rigger brush. And you might notice that the bristles on this brush are quite long. That's because the rigger brush is designed to make long, thin lines, such as branches. And that's what we're going to try to indicate here up in our bush tree area. So we'll just kind of start right here and make a little branch and maybe skip an area, make a little bit more, and you just kind of just put a few of those in there to kind of indicate that there are branches in this in this bush area. You can even let some of them stick up a little bit. It's just kind of a random thing. However you want to put them in there, and you can even make an indication that in some of these splattered areas uh, that that's part of the bush. And you can even take branches and bring them out in front of something else, like in front of our fence here now. Something like that. You have a tendency to want to get carried away with that. And... Um, it's a matter of personal preference how many of those you want to put in there. We'll just kind of leave that alone now. But it gives you an idea of the rigger brush and how you can use that to make branches inside of tree areas. Okay. All right, we've focused our camera in on the tree area now. And that second layer of color we put on the glazing has all dried. And now we want to add yet another layer on these trees in the way of shadows. We haven't really painted any shadows on our tree yet. And it stands to reason that if the light is coming from this direction and from above, that this area of the tree, the front areas and maybe the top areas of these trees will be light and the areas away from the sun, away from the direction of light, will be shadowed. So we want to get our I'm going to go ahead and go back to our one inch flat brush again and we're going to get quite a dark shadow color. A little bit of French ultramarine blue, maybe a little bit of red. A little bit of uh, burnt sienna. Alright, we have our brush loaded up with that shadow color now. We just want to start right here under the under the uh, along the wall of the house here. Again, we'll have to kind of watch out for this color wanting these uh, this pigment wanting to break over on us and drip down the painting. An opportunity to paint around the edge of that house again while we're doing these shadows. Again, you don't really want to scrub this. You just want to go ahead and 
put the pigment on and just kind of trust it. So that would be the underneath side of this tree. Just trying to indicate that there, are, there is indeed some shadow on these trees. Kind of do the same thing on this one now. On this area away from the sun, away from the light, we'll have a little bit of shadow on those trees. Just kind of put that, put that on there, that pigment on there, and don't try to scrub it. Remember, uh, just just let the paint flow on there, and we'll. You can always come back later after it dries, and make adjustments to that. We're just trying to get a darker or shadowed side of these trees. And we'll even go down here on the trees in the distance and kind of do the same thing. A little bit of shadowed side on those trees. All right. Now, we want to add some branches to these trees as we did over there in the fence area. But before we do that, we want to go ahead and let the shadow uh, pigment we just applied dry. Alright, our trees are pretty much dry now. Now we want to do a little bit more work in there. So we're going to get a couple of rigger brushes here. This is a number five rigger. Remember we introduced a rigger brush earlier when we worked in our fence area. And here's our number one rigger we used earlier. Again, these are Cheap Joe's Golden Fleece line. They have synthetic bristles. And we want to use the larger number five rigger first. And we want to kind of mix up a color for the branches and the trees. We want to do a little bit of work in there. Again, we're back to the idea of defining shapes. We want this to be quite dark. Just as we did with our tree trunks, we'll get some burnt sienna, some French blue. Just kind of make a dark color so we can make some branches inside there. Now what we want to try to do, you see that there are shapes here, various uh, large shapes inside the general form of the tree, and we want to paint between those shapes to kind of indicate that those are clumps of leaves or various shapes inside the tree, and we can do that by uh, stopping the branches at that point. So I'll go ahead and bring a branch up here, we'll say, stop it right there. Maybe it goes that way. Uh, maybe over this way a little bit. And maybe another branch. Maybe there's one here. This is just kind of a random thing. And again, you're just kind of trusting this as you do it. Maybe this comes up into here. You just kind of look at these, at these various shapes and try to make connections there. And I've got the larger rigger brush, uh, this work I'm doing now, and we'll come in there later on in a little bit with the smaller rigger brush and make finer branches. Same thing on this tree here. You can kind of see how I'm painting between these shapes here, kind of imagining some of those to be clumps of leaves, and the branches go between them. You're just kind of suggesting there that there's something going on inside that tree. Again, this is a very random kind of thing. Not necessarily any kind of formula for doing it. You just look at the shapes you see there and try to make some connections with those shapes. And we can do a little bit of that in the distant trees. We really want to probably use our smaller rigger brush for that. And again, just as before, uh, as with all, almost all the applications of paint, we can go up inside these branches while they're still wet and drop color in there. 
just to add a little bit more emphasis in a few areas. It's always okay to do that. Like I said, that doesn't necessarily always work out for you, but uh, it, it adds just a little bit more interest to, uh, to what you're doing. Okay, now let's put that larger rigger brush away. Again, we're, we're defining shapes inside these trees by using tree branches. We're just kind of making connections between those various shapes and it helps add more interest and kind of brings the tree to life a little bit more. So now we've got our smaller rigger brush loaded up with some of that same paint and we want to make some maybe some smaller branches in here. You just really need to kind of do just enough of this to uh, to add that texture inside that tree. There's a there is a tendency with these brushes to get uh, carried away and just keep painting branches and painting branches until pretty soon that's all you have. So you have to kind of make a limit to what you're doing. But again, that's a matter of personal preference. You can also take some branches uh, and and kind of silhouette them against that lighter the sky there in the background as if they're kind of coming down out of the tree. See if I can do one here that's a little bit more obvious. Maybe something like that. Maybe there's another one over here. Again, just to add a little bit more interest in that tree area. Kind of work on this little tree here a little bit now. Just kind of try to make the branch shape, kind of wiggle that brush around and make the branch shape uh, sort of random, sort of a natural shape. And kind of do this thing here again where we let one come out. Maybe this one's going up here. You can see that it's just kind of a random uh, motion there that you're doing with the brush and it's just a matter of personal preference how many branches you want to put in there. But the general idea is that, is that we've helped define some of these larger uh, shapes as clumps or divisions within the tree by interconnecting them with the branches. That's what the general idea there is in, in, the, in the overall definition of defining shapes kind of do that off in the distance here now a little bit. Now just as we did to practice one more time with this idea of splattering, just as we did over with the bush, we'll do a little bit of splattering now, especially in our closer trees. So again, I'll take the handle of my one inch flat, it's kind of a large handle, and I'll get my number eight pointed round, this is the Tsunami, put some paint just a dark color is really all we need. Again, I'll get some French ultramarine blue. A little burnt sienna, maybe a little red. It can be almost any color really, as long as it's a dark color. See how that works out. Now we'll just kind of splatter that in there a little bit in that tree. Again, this is all a matter of personal taste. You may or may not want to do this in your trees, but uh, just gives you a chance one more time in the painting we're doing here today to practice splattering. And again, as before, you can uh, blot up some of them, smear them around a little bit, make them a lighter color. You'll find that those really won't hurt your painting. Now, if they get over the sky area, it'll be okay. It really won't uh, cause nearly as much trouble as you think. And that, that kind of gets back to the idea that we talked about earlier on this painting. Uh, on this uh, uh, general work we're doing here to not worry too much about what you think are mistakes. You can always come back later and work on those some more. All right, we want to continue our work on our imagination painting now, on our details and texture. And now we want to paint our telephone poles in there. So for this telephone pole that's closest to us here, I'm going to stay with my number eight pointed round, the Tsunami, and we'll go ahead and mix up again a French ultramarine blue and a burnt sienna. That's, that pole is going to be quite dark. 
and we'll try to just get the shape in there and then and then uh, drop in a little bit of color after we get that get that dark shape in there. So, so we just want to start right up here at the top and just put kind of a dark shape in there. You don't have to get it absolutely perfect. You don't have to stay right in the pencil lines. Just paint right over all this other work we did in here. Just bring that right on down here. Right about in there. And now we want to get some colors and drop them in there. We'll get a little bit of burnt sienna, drop it in in a couple places. Just while that telephone pole is still wet. You see that I came out of the lines there a little bit, but don't try to try to get used to the idea as we were saying before uh, in, a, in an earlier video of not worrying about uh, what you think are mistakes. Just go ahead and put your paint on there and try to avoid the temptation of doing a lot of scrubbing. <clears throat> put a little bit of a dark shape in there. It just adds a little bit of interest uh, instead of just having just a just a straight uh, line right there of all one color. Try to try to get used to the idea of putting a little bit of variety into those shapes. Now the other telephone pole shapes off in the distance are a little bit thinner. We're going to want those to be a little bit thinner. So I'm going to go to our number six pointed round. Same color, same kind of technique I used there. I just want to first just put the shape in. So we'll just start right up here. We want to keep the height of those poles, the relative height, because remember we established that when we did our perspective sketch. I'm going to put just enough paint on there to kind of to kind of get it wet a little bit. And then again you can drop in some color into a few areas. Don't try to get the pole uh, absolutely perfect. If you get it off a little bit, a little crooked, a little wavy, uh, try not to, to concern yourself with that kind of thing too much. Just drop in your colors the way you kind of generally want it to look and then uh, and then move on to your next thing. And, and it'll always, for the most part, that will always work out better for you if you don't stay and try to to uh, labor just in one area for a long period of time. Just go ahead and put in your colors, put in your shape right there, and, uh, and then leave it as it is. Nearly every time that'll work out best for you. Now I want to try to use this same brush and just make a thin line here. We could wait and use our rigger brush. Let's we'll see if we can make a little thin line across here for that cross piece. You do have to kind of watch out for your hand in areas of wet paint. You can get that on the heel of your hand, as I have a little bit there, and wind up kind of stamping that around on the whole painting. I've done that many times myself. Again, not, not necessarily a real big deal, but it can happen to you. Um, now I'm going to go for these distant poles to this number four pointed round. We used that earlier, I believe, when we did the work on the fence. Same thing again. I want these shapes here to be probably a little bit more blue. They're a little bit more off in the distance. A little bit more sort of a gray blue color. Not quite as heavy on the line this time. And again, just kind of bring that line right on down there. These little cross pieces here. Another one here. And one more there. Okay, now the next thing we'd like to do is put a little bit of shadow up on those transformers. Remember we masked those transformers in our last video, in our shadows video. And so they're, they're a, a white color. Now we're going to go ahead and put a little bit of shadows on, shadow on those. 
Now they're cylinders, so usually the shadow up at the top of a cylinder is a little bit curved, like this, and then on the back side of this uh, transformer will be shadowed because our light's coming from over here. So we'll just kind of make that curved shape at the top, shadow down the side, and then we'll get some water and so that line isn't quite so hard along that shadow will kind of wet the paper. Remember, the uh, pigment will migrate into wet paper and that'll kind of smooth that line out a little bit on those transformers. I will go ahead and let that dry. Now maybe some wires hooking to those poles. And, and again, this is the kind of thing you have to not be afraid to do. You've got to be willing to kind of experiment a little bit when you do your paintings. These, won't, these lines won't always come out perfectly straight, but uh, you just kind of have to throw them in there and just kind of trust it a little bit. So we'll kind of see what happens. I've got this number one rigger again, a little bit of sort of a blue gray paint, and we'll just kind of start right here and just kind of connect to that pole there. Come across here with a wire Maybe another one here. Don't have to get them perfect. Doesn't have to be a perfect line. Just, just an indication that there's a wire there. So wire going on down to that next pole. Kind of brought those wires in behind those transformers there. A little bit more of that here, here. Here. Just kind of have fun with it. It's okay. And then in a couple of places in the wire, you can kind of darken it a little bit just to add again a little bit of texture. In some ways, if your wires don't come out perfect, it actually adds a little bit of character to the painting. It actually uh, comes out a little better that way. Now again, uh, down on our roadway here, let's come back one more time and practice this idea of splattering. Just kind of getting a little red, a little blue, a little bit of all the colors I have down on my palette. We'll just kind of splatter on this roadway in a couple places. And again, that just adds a little bit of texture there. You can kind of take your finger, spread some of that out a little bit, leave the rest of them alone. Alright, now we have a couple of areas here and here where we still have a fairly light color. We want to go ahead and put a little bit of gray on there now. Just kind of mix up a little bit of French ultramarine blue and a little bit of burnt sienna. Make a little bit of that neutral, that gray color. We're just going to put a little bit of paint on that area. We may want to put a little bit more on there later. Just kind of darken that up a little bit. Remember, we just want to put our paint on there. Don't scrub it a lot. If it doesn't come out dark enough, you can always come back later and put a little bit more on there. So we'll just leave that alone for now. Now one other thing we want to look at here is, if you recall, when we had our discussion about uh, mixing color, if you mix uh, any two of the primary colors, you'll get a secondary color. And then the remaining primary color, if it's mixed with that secondary color, will form a gray or neutral color. Now if you keep increasing the amount of pigment you put in that mixture, uh, you'll get a darker and darker gray color until finally, as you continue adding, adding more pigment, you get a black, or, or nearly a black color. And when you get to this later stage in the painting here, we've, we're uh, about to finish up our imagination painting here, uh, you start putting darker and darker colors on. So we want to look now at mixing up uh, a nearly black color, quite a dark color, and put that just in a few places in our painting to add a little bit more detail, a little bit more texture. Now the brush I'm going to use here for this is a number three rigger. 
And earlier when we put this gray on here, that was our uh, number eight tsunami. Number eight pointed round. Here we have uh, this number three rigger, and again that's uh, Cheap Joe's uh, golden fleece, and it's got the synthetic bristles. We're going to use that brush to mix up quite a dark color. Now, uh, there are two ways, fairly easy ways, of getting these near black colors. Uh, one is uh, to mix burnt sienna and French ultramarine blue. And that's the first dark color I'm going to use here. And another uh, way you can mix a near black color is to mix Windsor Green Blue Shade with Alizarin Crimson. Both of those will make uh, a near black or very dark color. Now notice in both those mixtures we're kind of taking a shortcut there because with the uh, Burnt Sienna <clears throat> we have kind of an orange color which is what you get when you mix red and yellow and we're mixing that with the remaining primary color blue as French ultramarine blue. And with the Windsor Green, we've already got that mix, the uh, blue and yellow that makes a green, and then the remaining primary color would be a Lizarin Crimson or red. And that's just an easy way because you of uh, mixing your black or your dark colors because you only have to mix two colors that way. Uh, so that's just kind of a shortcut to get that near black, very dark, uh, color for, for your paintings. Now, usually at the end, uh, when you're putting on these very dark colors, you're putting, in, putting them in just touching them here and there in fairly small areas. Now, one area we want to come over here and add a little bit more darkness to is between the slats, like as if we're seeing that bush uh, through the slats of this fence. So in just a couple of places, I'm going to kind of darken this a little bit. See that whole slat there? Maybe a place there, another one here. You're just kind of putting little marks on here and there now in your painting just to add little bits of emphasis to certain areas. And also, just as we said before with contact, contrast switching, uh, every time you put a dark in somewhere, it makes another thing near it look a little lighter. Just come right in here on this slat, maybe put it a little dark there. This is just pretty much uh, up to your own discretion or your own taste when you're doing this. We'll paint around this fence post down here again. Put a little dark in there. I'm just using this number three rigger and I've got a really dark almost black color and I'm just putting that in in a few places here just to kind of emphasize a few areas in the painting. Maybe a little there. There's no particular formula for this. You're just kind of putting these dark places in here and there, as I said, just to add a little bit more texture to the painting. You can even come up here in the bush area, in this foliage, put a little bit more dark in there. just in a few areas. And then you can add a few more branches with this darker color. Again, on, on your painting, if you're painting along with me at home, you don't necessarily have to put these in the, in the same place as I'm doing. Just kind of practice the idea of putting in a little bit more texture with this really dark color. I can go on this telephone pole here now, maybe on the shadowed side, put a little bit more of a dark area there. You're just kind of touching your painting just here and there, putting on a few dark areas. You can even get into grassy areas and just put a little bit of texture in like that. Now one more thing we want to demonstrate here, just, as, uh, just to finish up, I'm going to go do one more thing with this kind of dark color. I think I'll kind of go along this horizon line here just a little bit in a few areas. Kind of have that show up a little bit more where the tree line meets the uh, 
meet the grassy areas there off in the distance. Just kind of darken those up maybe just a little bit. Again, that's strictly up to you whether you want to do that in your painting. We're just trying to show here with our painting how you can use a dark color constantly against a light color and keep going darker and darker in your painting to add your details and texture. Now what I want to do, I'm going to uh, I'm going to bring one more brush here into the picture. This is a three-quarter inch flat. We had a one inch flat that we used earlier. That would be fine for this exercise I'm going to do now. I want to demonstrate one last technique to you here called dry brushing. Now dry brushing is where you've loaded your, paint, your brush up with a particular color. Here I'm mixing burnt sienna and alizarin crimson. We're going to demonstrate this up on the roof area there. So I've got that loaded up in my brush and I'm just going to kind of dry that brush off a little bit so I don't have quite so much liquid pigment in there. And then I'm going to take my brush just very flat instead of more this way as you would make a stroke. This is just going to be so the brush is almost parallel with the paper. And I'm just going to kind of drag that along here just to demonstrate a little bit of the technique here. Hopefully this will show up okay on camera. Get a little bit more pigment in that. This would be as if there was uh, some sort of texture or maybe some roofing of some type or other on this uh, roof of this house. I guess we're pretty much done with this one. I hope you all had a good time painting along with me on our imagination painting. Alright, now what we want to do is frame up our imagination painting from our workshop. And we want to start out with uh, what's called a mat. Lay that down here so you can see it. Now, a mat starts out as a mat board, a solid piece of mat board like this. And then an opening is cut inside the mat board to accommodate the artwork. Now I measured the painting we did in our workshop. I'll go ahead and lay that here so you can see it. And I measured it to be 15 inches high by 22 and a half inches wide. Now the opening I've had cut in my mat board is 14 inches high by 20 and a half inches wide. So you can see that that's an inch shorter, the height of this, than our painting, and two inches shorter in width than our painting. And that's to allow for an overlap of the painting around the margin of the mat opening. Now if you recall from when we did our painting, I used clips to hold my watercolor paper to my gator foam board. And that makes these little white areas you see here on the sides. So I wanted my margin on the two sides to be a little more than the margin on the top. So the one inch difference I have on the height, I just divide that by two and that gives me a half inch top and bottom for my margin to center the painting in the opening. And then my difference in width is two inches, so if I divide that by two, I get a one inch margin on each side. Now I've made a pencil line here on the side and on the top to indicate where those margins will be. And I'm looking at the mat board here from the rear, from the back. You can see that I have a sketch on the back of this paper. And you can use both sides of watercolor paper, by the way, in case you were wondering about that. And we're going to want to secure 
the painting to the mat board on those margin lines. All right, so I have our painting on those margin lines, and we're going to use a product called Framers Tape. It comes in a roll, and it's just kind of a plastic or acrylic tape with an acid-free adhesive. I'll take some small pieces of that tape, and secure our painting right on those margin lines. So I'll just put a piece in the middle here, burnish that down, and a piece of that tape on either side. And now when we turn the mat over, you can see that we have our painting now secured inside the mat. Now we want to make what's called a sandwich, or what I call a sandwich anyway. So we want to get our solid piece of mat board here, and we're going to use that or what's called a backer board. Now the backer board will go behind the mat with the painting mounted in it. And then on top we're going to put a piece of glass. Now this is what's called non-glare glass. We may get a little bit of glare in our camera shot. Hopefully we won't. And those three parts put together make up what I call a sandwich, and that's what we will slide inside of our frame. So we'll do that next. All right, now we have our frame in the camera shot. And this particular frame is a metal frame and aluminum frame made by Nielsen. And when you order your frame, it comes in uh, separate pieces top, bottom, and sides, and it has corner hardware and wire hanger hardware, and instructions come with those with the frame, so we won't go into the details of that here, but we've assembled the frame and we've left the bottom piece off so we can slide our sandwich inside the frame. And that's what we want to do next. Now, by the way, when you purchase your frame parts, components, you specify the outside dimensions of the sandwich. The outside dimensions of the frame are always slightly larger. I have to make sure I get all the parts of my sandwich inside the frame, and I believe I have done that. And by the way, this is the top of the frame, so you want the top of the image to be here and not here. You'll have it in there upside down. I've done that many times myself. Now we want to just raise that up and let that fall down into the bottom channel. So now we have our sandwich inside of the frame. Now we want to take the last frame component and there are these little corner pieces And they slide into channels here at the back of the frame. And again, we want to make sure that our sandwich is inside the channel for that piece. And now there are set screws in these corner pieces in the, uh, in the frame assembly. You just tighten those with a screwdriver. Now we have that secured as one piece. And then Nielsen provides some springs, little spring pieces here, that slide in between the frame back and the backer board to help secure the sandwich in place. We'll just put a few of these springs around the perimeter here. Keep sure sandwich from 
shaking around inside of the uh, inside the frame, holds it securely. Those just you just push them down to depress them, and then they slide in the gap there. And now we're ready to have a look at our framed painting. So there's our workshop imagination painting mounted in a frame. I hope you'll uh, try that with your own paintings at home. You can buy all the components from your frame supplier and have them cut the mat for you so you really don't have to get into mat cutting and it does uh, add a lot to the appearance of your paintings. Well I really had a good time today painting on our imagination painting. I hope many of you were painting along with me. Today we looked at adding details and texture to our painting. And one of the main techniques we used for that was defining shapes. Now defining shapes is where we use the technique of painting around and also make doing some painting inside of the shapes to make a generalized shape look more like a more recognizable or specific shape. In this case we mainly demonstrated that with the fence. Uh, the fence at first was just the shape of two walls uh, drawn in perspective, but there was no definition as to what kind of fence it was, so we used painting around and also painting inside of the walls of the fence to make it appear to be a picket fence. We also use the idea of defining shapes in our trees. At first we had just the large shape uh, of, a, of a tree in our tree line there. And then we painted inside the tree shape with smaller shapes and then connected those shapes with tree branches to help emphasize the idea that those were indeed trees. We also looked at a technique called splattering. That's one of the more fun techniques in watercolor where you actually load up a lot of pigment in your brush and then you can either hit the brush against the handle of another brush or you can just flick the brush to throw droplets of paint onto the paper and you get some very uh, unpredictable and interesting shapes doing that. We also looked at a technique called dry brushing. Now, dry brushing is where you take advantage of the roughness of watercolor paper to get a textured appearance. You put less pigment in the brush and kind of draw the surface of the brush across the surface of the paper and, and just let the, the brush touch the high points in the paper and you get this very interesting texture doing that. Also you get the general idea of watercolor being a medium where you paint generally from, a, from lighter intensity colors to darker colors. All the while adding a little bit more emphasis and a little bit more detail to the painting. Again, we're still using that general technique of glazing to slowly build up uh, a painting that has more and more character and more and more interest. I hope you'll practice many of the techniques we demonstrated today. I hope you'll go out and make observations. I hope we've inspired you to do that, both in the area of perspective, which is kind of where we started our workshop, uh, and also on the idea of shadows, observing the two types of shadows. And, and, and things that you observe now will probably not look the same as they did before. I also hope that you'll stick with this idea of telling a story when you paint. Not try so hard to make a really great painting. It's telling that story that will keep you painting. We want you to continue painting and have a lifetime of enjoyment painting with watercolors.